On Blast. This is Ball on Blast, part of the On Blast Podcast Network. Available on iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube. If you like it, then subscribe and tell your friends. Holla. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're far too kind for tuning in once again to another thing we like to call the Ball on Blast Podcast. My name is Sheldon Alexander, and as always, I'm joined by my guy, Andrew Webster. Webby, what is good? Sheldon Alexander, are you ready to live in a world where Joel Embiid is the MVP favorite in the NBA? Woo! Woo! I mean... It's funny how this all went down, and I guess we're going to just jump right into this. No beating around the bush. Let's Listen, just we right had a busy week. We had a busy week in the NBA, man, and it's, Ameri- it's, it's American Thanksgiving. There's no NBA on TV, and listen, nope. I, if, you were, uh, if you were on the internet uh, the last couple of days, you know that we may not be the only ones who don't like that there's no NBA on Thanksgiving. Kyrie Irving, just not a big fan of Thanksgiving in general. <laughs> True. I mean, it's weird, but, you know, regular listeners know that we record this on Thursday night. You hear it Friday morning. But normally there's a, like NBA action going on for us while we're discussing it. But all that means was that the Wednesday night sked was oh, crazy. Man. So we'll we'll switch things up a little bit here because there are just so many headlines that happened. So let's let's kind of just race through some things here. OK, Webby, does that Hit sound me. cool? So massive head-to-head showdown between JoJo, Joel Embiid, and Anthony Davis. Big win for your Sixers. But you mentioned Joel Embiid creeping into that MVP talk. What was that? What do you have? 31 and 19 in I think that he's game? got 31 and 10 or more in 10 of the last 12 games. Who? 30 I mean, and 10 in the last 12 games it is, or something. Insane. They haven't lost at home this year either, the Sixers. It's crazy what's happened here, and it's also interesting to me that so much talk about Jimmy Butler, Jimmy Butler, Jimmy Butler, which is cool. Jimmy Butler is a massive piece of this team, but that's only going to open things up more for Embiid, no? Absolutely. The the other thing, too, is that we've been kind of talking about this over the last couple of years, especially when it comes to the NBA, in that the the role of a traditional big man, the role of a traditional five, somebody who can play with his back to the basket, back you down and get points is something that's kind of disappeared in today's NBA. And and to have somebody like Joel Embiid who's taken that style of play and meshed it with the spread out uh, offense uh, shooting three balls part of the NBA, which is now in effect, to see somebody mesh those two kind of ways of thinking together into one player has been really special to see. And I, I know that I'm a huge homer, but... There's there's very few players out there that are more fun to watch on a night-to-night basis than Joel Embiid. No, that's totally cool. I, I totally agree with you. I think JoJo is having a massive season, and I'll agree with you. I think he is definitely a legitimate MVP candidate this season. Just what he's doing with that team right now, those numbers, those numbers don't lie, right? Like, he's putting in gangster work. And, you know... You're right. In the way that the NBA is played now, there's so much, like, I'm the one that said, I'm like, I don't know if you can win with, you know, a traditional, and I know he's not really, it's not all just back to the basket, but still, most of his damage is done in the paint, right? And so, I didn't know if you could still succeed like that at a championship level with that being your best player. Now, when you add in Jimmy Butler on one side and, you know, uh, your man's uh, Ben Simmons on the other. And that's another player who's kind of a hybrid, something that you don't see anymore, which is a point guard who can't shoot. Yeah. So you got a point guard <laughs> right. who can't shoot, and you got a big man who's playing with his back to the basket who can hit threes. It, it's uh, cr- it, it's a, it's yeah. crazy. So let's let's just try to continue to rapid fire through some things here. And so yeah, we both agree, JoJo legit MVP candidate. Cool. Also that we saw, the Celtics are really struggling. The Celtics oh are sputtering as of late. They lost at home to the Knicks. Is it time to worry about the Celts there, Webby? You know. Celtics losers of uh, five of their last seven games. Oh, And it's not getting any better when you read the, uh, the reports coming out of Boston that there's infighting and things going on. This is a young, impressionable team. But again, I'm going to say that it's early. 
I mean, okay. we're not even in December yet. Really, the NBA season doesn't get kicked into earnest until like Christmas Day, right? Now, if this continues for the next month, then yeah, we got a problem. But there's still enough time that the, this is a team, especially with Danny Ainge as a GM, that's going to be active trying to make trades. And you've still got probably the best coach in the NBA in, in Brad Stevens. So I'm sure that they're just kind of figuring things out. But, man, I'll tell you, this Gordon Hayward thing, it, it doesn't look good. I'm going to say, Webby, that I'm not worried. But the reason why I'm not worried is because if you listen to this podcast, I told you all this was going to happen. There are too many dudes on this Boston Celtics team. It's not going to work. And the wins that they did have, one came against the Bulls. The other was the Raptors when Kyrie basically just came out on a yeah. mission that game and said, I am not losing this game, right? And so that masks, you know, every once in a while, if Kyrie can do that, cool. It'll mask, mask the issues for one night. But overall, this is a problem. Too many guys on that team, as I said from the get-go, Gordon Hayward now that talks about, oh, coming off the bench, like you're paying a max dude to come off the bench, it doesn't make sense. But then... The reports of, uh, did you hear, see any of those quotes from uh, Jason Tatum talking about working out with Kobe and Kobe basically telling him, like, to just shoot? Yeah. <laughs> like, like it, we think this is going to work. Yo, that's some, like, uh, Kobe... that, that's some double agent shit, too, that Kobe's doing <laughs> just, to, just to try and throw Boston off their game. Like, he doesn't want the Celtics to win another championship, you know? So he's just trying to take yeah. Tatum under his wing and give him all this bad advice. But honestly, Celtics with, with oh, the Celtics, it's a good problem to have, especially this early. To find out who's expendable and who you want to keep. Because moves can be made. I mean, you're you're totally right. But on the flip side here, we're at Thanksgiving. U.S. Thanksgiving, yes. And it is, the Celtics are in 8th place right now. At 9-9 nine and nine in the Eastern Conference. That's all. I mean, I don't think it'll stay there. Because Danny Ainge isn't the guy to kind of just chill. Right? So, something's got to give there. And I think something will give there. But... This team is currently constituted. I didn't think was going to work. You just have too many guys. But as I said, let's keep scrolling through here the headlines because there it was a busy NBA night on Wednesday. As busy NBA night, but just also like top storylines. What about right? what so, about my boy Doey Doncic? Well, it's interesting what's going on there, man. I mean, they are. Eight and nine right yeah. now, seven and two at home. Surprise team so far in the NBA. One of them, anyways. But I think that highlights a greater point. You look at the Maz, but also another big win for the Grizzlies Yo, in the Grizzlies. Uh, San Antonio. And when you look at the standings in the Western Conference, okay, it is a weird it picture is. right now. Because in first place, you have the Memphis Grizzlies. Second place, Portland Trail Blazers. Third place, the LA Clippers. Like, who would have predicted that? That, to me, goes to your point of it's early. Yeah. You know what I mean? But still, OKC's in, in fourth. The Warriors have dropped to fifth. Then it's Denver, Lakers, and the, the Rockets, right? But you mentioned the Mavs. We'll start there. Surprise team so far at eight and nine. Are you, I mean, you're in on the Doncic train. That's what, that's what you're telling me? Yo, you know, I've been saying it since draft night. Uh, is he doughy or is he just a white guy? I don't know, but he can he play, can man. And I'm telling you, he's that's this is a kid at 18 who's only going to get yeah. better, who's only going to grow into that body. He's got the experience, and honestly, man, if the Mavericks, I know that this is a franchise that's been kind of in flux over the last like nine, ten months. A lot of it not to do with basketball. But if this is an organization that can really look ahead the next two, three years, I think we could see the Dallas Mavericks really becoming a powerhouse in the West. The other thing, too, with the Dallas Mavericks is once you start getting the pieces, you have one of the best coaches in the league, right? Like Rick Carlisle's there. 100%. So, oh, yeah. You know, they just got to – they're like a couple moves away from really making some noise in the West and a very tough Western Conference as well, right? Because the second last place team in the West – is the Minnesota Timberwolves, and they are three games out of eighth. So yeah, everybody's bunched it up. It is there. crazy. Now, I'm, my question for you is: of those three teams, what do we say? The the uh, Grizzlies, and the Clippers. Trailblazers, and the Clippers. 
at the end of the year, who's got the highest seed of those three teams? I'm going to say the Blazers. reason I say that is because Memphis always plays well, and then Mike Connolly gets hurt. That's happened, what, each of the last two or three years at least? And the Clippers, as nice as the run is now, and it's an interesting team, right? Like, the Clippers got some very interesting pieces. They're all playing hard. They're doing it with, like, no real superstar per se. And I heard a very interesting – who brought it? I forget what broadcast I was watching. But it was someone who obviously is – was a former teammate with Sam Cassell, who's an assistant in L.A., right? And oh, yeah. he was talking about yeah. how the reason why their team is so successful is because they don't have a superstar. And so take that mentality yeah. of all these dudes that had to fight to be in the league because they're not stars, but also they get rewarded with playing time by playing hard and playing well. Everything that they get with the team on a night-to-night basis, their minutes are earned. So... You're just coming in with straight energy guys every second, right? It's just go, 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 go. And that leads to regular season success. Now, come playoff time, might be a different story, but for the regular season anyways, you can win a lot of games on effort in the NBA, night after night, right? It's almost like the opposite of the problem that the Celtics are having. Yes. Where the Celtics have too many guys. (laughs) Yes, yes. The Clippers need guys, (laughs) but... And instead, the guys that they're rolling out, like you say, they're mm-hmm. hungry. A- and this team has really taken the uh, the personality of their coach. And I mean, we've made a lot of Doc Rivers jokes in my time, and so jokes. have you. Yep. But, man, if he is not imprinting his personality on this team. You know what? It's interesting, too, right? And I know there's people might be listening being like, wait, what do you mean that there's too many guys on the Celtics and not enough guys on the Clippers, right? Here's the thing about – the game of basketball in its most simplistic form, right? There's a, it's about roles, right? And the problem with the Celtics, if you have too many guys who think that I should be the man, I should be scoring, yeah. then, you know, you need to mix in one of those guys who's just a rebounder, who's just doing all the dirty work, who just knows my role is to go out and play hard defense and guard up. Not the guy who... A Reggie Evans. Right? But just, like, not the guy who, you know... I'm shooting now because I haven't shot the last three times down the floor. I got to get this shot up next time I touch the ball. Whereas the Clippers, everything's just all these guys who their minutes come from their hard work. So they can't take a lapse or a, a possession off on defense, right? They can't not box out because if they don't box out, they're not going to play. Right. So interesting times for sure. Makes for an interesting regular season when you get these like, great storylines of these teams getting off to great starts. And on the flip side, we're starting to see the Lakers kind of coming on, the Rockets kind of coming on as of late. Um, I want to ask you about LeBron's return to Cleveland because that also happened on a on what we're calling a hectic Wednesday night in the NBA. But yeah. what did you make of LeBron's return? Did you catch any of that? Like He seemed to get a really good, like big standing ovation. Like Was that as expected or were you surprised by, yeah. by the response? Bro. He brought a chip to the land. Like, come on, man. It doesn't matter where he was going to go. You know that Cleveland was going to show their love. And I thought that uh, Cleveland, the, the, the Cavs, really played up to the competition. Mm-hmm. I thought they played one of their best games of the season with LeBron in town. And I don't know if you watch any of that game, but I just kind of saw a highlight on um, on Twitter or on Reddit. I forget. But did you see Chetty hitting the three-pointer there late? No, I didn't see that. I like didn't see that. Like late in the game to cut it to like one okay. point or to tie it or whatever. Chetty hits the three-pointer, some crazy off-balance three right in LeBron's face. <laughs> and then there's a there's a timeout, and then after the timeout, Chetty comes back onto the court, and he just kind of looks at LeBron and smiles, and they start to laugh and do the thing where they pull the jersey yeah, up over yeah. the mouth. And like I was like, all right, that's cool, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's good. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing too, right? And I know it sounds cheesy and it's a cliche. It's becoming the cliche of LeBron saying bigger than basketball and all that stuff. I think all of those people involved, like Cavs fans, and but even the guys on the team, realize that that championship was so much more than basketball for everyone involved, right? Oh, for the yeah, fans, absolutely. For, the city, for LeBron, right? For those guys to see like what that meant to not only him, but to the, the city of Cleveland. I mean... You mentioned how the Cavs came out and played a really good game. I think it's one of those nights where you get a little extra juice from the crowd, right? The crowd's fired up. 
that gives the players a little extra juice as well for those games. So that was definitely cool to see. I agree with you. The video they played was really cool too. It seemed like it was a moment for LeBron, you know? So yeah, yeah. I mean, the Cavs, we mention it every week. They're in the Zion RJ sweepstakes. So oh. right? we'll get to that. We'll get there. We'll get there. Don't worry, Webby. Don't worry. We'll get there. But yeah. Crazy night on the NBA sked on Wednesday. Yeah, LeBron making his return to Cleveland as a member. Didn't of even the Lakers. Sorry, what didn't even say? talk about the Raptors. Exactly. Game winner from Danny Green. Game winner from Danny Green. When was that? That was Tuesday night. First game of the back to of the. Oh, back-to-back. I thought that was Wednesday. No. Who did Wednesday they play? Wednesday was the Hawks game on the second night of a back to back. And ah, that was right, a Kyle right, right. Lowry game. That was your your Philly guys game. Triple double. Triple dub for Kyle Lowry. Raptors, still the best team in the NBA at 15-4, and four, but went on a back-to-back. First, night, first half of the back-to-back, they drop a play at the buzzer for Danny Green. Danny Yo, Green good hits a play. game winner. That's another difference. That's what I was going to bring up is that, like, that's a Nick Nurse play. Like, mm-hmm. that's not necessarily a play that Dwayne Casey would have drawn up. Right? For someone, like, not named Kyle or DeMar, right? Super interesting. Exactly. But to kick off our turn up, turn down segment, the question I want to ask you is about the second night of the Raptors back to back, which was a win in Atlanta. Raptors win big in a blowout win. Kyle Lowry is a triple double, but someone else stole the show. And this person might be familiar to Raptors fans as his name is Vincent Lamar Carter. Now, your man's Vince Carter stole the show because he got a last second dunk to become the 22nd player in NBA history to reach 25,000 points. Now, turn up, turn down segment. My bad, I didn't explain how this segment works for the new people to the podcast. But essentially, we make a hot take, and it's either turn up, which equals good, or turn down, which equals bad. Pretty simple, right? So I get it. (laughs) The first hot take is... Vince Carter's 25,000 points versus the Raptors was lame. Webby, turn up or turn down? I'm very much on the same page as you on this one, my friend Sheldon. (laughs) This was very, very lame. There is not much that Vince Carter has done since he's left the Raptors that has not been super lame. (laughs) All right? And this was no different. And what I don't understand is, and I'm sure we're going to get into this, Mm -hmm. but why does... I mean, I ask this rhetorically because, of course, I know why. But why is it every time this guy does anything at all, mm-hmm. whether it's in pregame warm-ups or shoot-around after the game, in a game, everybody fawns over Vince Carter like it's the end-all, be-all. Okay, I got no time for this guy. <laughs> Bro, just leave the NBA. I like. I, I do not say this kind of vitriol for many players other than Vince Carter. This guy is uh, uh, uh he's thirsty. Ooh, it's that's like an Vince Carter putting it. Yeah. It's like Vince Carter is in the desert and he's thirsty and it's been this way since he's been on the Raptors. You, you know, he he's Vincey headlines. Vinny headlines. <laughs> he wants to he wants to get he wants to get mentioned in the blogs about how great he is and how uh, inspirational his performance was to all these young NBA players that are coming about now. You know what Vince Carter was? A good dunker. So here's my thing, and I agree with you, right? And people were getting at me from last night's podcast that we did. Again, Wrap It Up podcast, selfless, shameless plug. Wrap It Up podcast airs after each and every Toronto Raptors game live on Twitter, at Shell Alexander. Obviously, I had a lot to say about that, and much of it sounded exactly like what you just said, right? It was super lame. And the 25,000 points, whatever, like, I don't know what that really means in the grand scheme of things, especially when you're talking about someone who's played 20 years in the NBA. That's a How many finals appearances does Vince Carter have? Right? And so, to me, it was super funny, but to me, the thing that made it lame was the fact that, A, this was in a blowout game. B, you only needed 13 points to get there, but yet the final three minutes of the game was, was straight him garbage up, time. And was him hucking up shots. Yeah, it was so pathetic, right? And so to, to back up your point, right, what I was saying last night was 
it was such a do it for the gram type moment because Vince getting it on a dunk at the very end of the game was what you would see on Instagram. That would be the highlight clip on Instagram, right? Yeah. What you didn't see was the two minutes prior of Vince Carter jacking up shots, trying to get to 13 points for the entire game, but doing this with like the Raptors 905 on the floor in garbage time and dudes on the, the, a roster that's already filled with who he played for all stars, but basically the end of their bench and Vince Carter. And these guys were full court pressing the Raptors and trapping the Raptors to try to get the ball back to get more possessions so that Vince Carter again could get 13 points. Like you said, thirsty. I totally agree with you. It was so pathetic and so sad to me, but, but Webby, I'm going to use this opportunity to do a little something because I did mention to the people that were writing in last night onto the Wrap It Up podcast to let me know what you think. And I'm now going to read back some comments so you can hear it too because I wanted okay. to know if like I and I guess now you are in the minority. Do most What do most Wrap Up fans fi- feel? I figure I am in the minority. There's two things I figure I'm in the minority about and it's the <laughs> things that I yell the loudest about. And that's A... <laughs> The Raptors broadcast on television is the worst in the league. And B, Vince Carter is the most overrated NBA superstar in the history of the association. I mean, I don't disagree with you on the the Vince Carter because to me, the only way that I found last night like poetic in any way, shape or form was that was the most Vince Carter thing ever, right? Like trying so hard in a meaningless game to get like some like achievement that doesn't mean that much really compared to where the Raptors are now as a franchise in terms of you're talking about actual championship aspirations. Not only champion, yeah, like sustained, prolonged playoff performances and getting better every year. Playoff success, something else Vince Carter is not familiar with. And you're right. When you look at his career, like what did he really accomplish after he left the Raptors? Not much. Bro, even on the Raptors, how many finals appearances? True. And and again, how many how many conference finals appearances did he make? They had one playoff series win. Right. So it's like it's one of those things where people now, because everything becomes romanticized, so we forget about the moment and we forget that he admitted that he quit on the team and then left and started trying again. Like that's not hyperbole. That's from his mouth. Right. So I'm, I just found this funny because I'm going to read you some of the comments here. Okay. Webby? Okay. So uh, some dude named galaxy traveler says, Oh man, I had so many feels when that happened. Absolutely loved how that game ended a dunk. Even I wish so bad. He would go back to Toronto for his last year and retire his Jersey there. He still hasn't gotten a ring and he might be able to, to if he plays on the Raptors team. Oh, my God. (laughs) Uh, The next someone named uh, Romel says, I didn't forget, and I get it. Uh, Alex says, take this video down, bro. (laughs) (laughs) Again, the video is just me from the podcast last night on our postgame show just crushing Vince Carter. So, yeah, Alex clearly disagrees. Um, WC says, Vince put the Raptors on the map. He was pretty much why the team never folded like the Grizzlies in Van. Show respect. Maybe you're too young to remember. Vince Carter was many of your favorite players, favorite player growing up, including the likes of Kevin Durant. Now. um, This guy obviously doesn't know how old my ass is. Yeah, for sure. You definitely don't know how old I am. Also, I'll say check the resume. But I'll say this. (laughs) Vince Carter, like I am definitely old enough to remember. And, you know. Oh, hold on. He followed up. He replied to his own thing and said, I do understand your point. He left on bad terms. And also T-Mac, the past is the past. Okay. I mean, here's my thing, right? Here's my thing to that comment in particular. Yes. Vince Carter definitely put the Raptors on the map. He definitely did a lot. Cool. No one's denying that. But we're at the end of the day, we're still talking about a slam dunk trophy. Right? Like, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. That's the only hardware he has. No problem what's, there. He, what's, he the highest he's, what's the highest he's finished in MVP voting? Uh, that's a good question. I guess we could look that up on Basketball Reference. Um, the one thing, though, that I will say about Vince Carter, too, is, you know, I understand, you know, the point that people make when they talk about how when you ask, you know, the Corey Josephs, the 
Tristan Thompson, right. all these guys, Wiggins, they all say that, hey, Vince Carter played a massive part in why they play basketball. I agree with that, right? Totally get it. I was a diehard Raptor fan as a young buck in what? When did Vince come in? Like 98? So I'm in high school at that point. Like, I get it. It was a massive, massive deal. But I'm just saying, I will never forget that you quit, bro. Yeah. yeah. That's just no, no, For real, I, this is what I don't understand. Real Raptors fans saying that they want him to come back and finish his career with the Toronto Raptors. I don't understand. Being a hardcore sports fan, I can never understand that. It's not like this guy put himself on the line for this team. In fact, he did quite the opposite. <laughs> when, the, when the going went tough, he got the F out of town. Yep. And it wasn't like he got out of town because he became a free agent and somebody yeah. offered him more money. No, he forced his way out of town. Yeah. No, definitely. I mean, the thing, too, with Vince Carter, I'm trying to look this up right now, and I see MVP award shares. Is that a thing? Is that the stat? I think. I'm not sure. Uh, well, this says the highest he finished was 10th in 1999-2000. 1999-2000. Yeah. This says the highest would be 10th in MVP award shares. Uh, let's see here. Vince Carter, yeah, finished 10th in voting, in MVP voting in 1999-2000. 10th. That is the highest he, he finished Tenth. in MVP voting. I'm pretty sure, I'm going to look this up right now, but I'm pretty sure even Chris Bosh had a season higher than that for the Raptors. <laughs> I'm, and I don't mean that to, like, as shots or anything. Well, maybe I guess I kind of do. <laughs> no. But 100% I would... Year. 100% I'd be happier if Chris Bosh came and retired as a Raptor than I would if Vince did. Yeah, Vin, or Chris Bosh in 2006-2007 finished 7th in MVP voting. Wow. <laughs> Let that soak in, Raptors fans. Wow. Let that soak in. Um, yeah, I mean, just interesting times for, for what that was. Um, do we want to hear some more comments? I, I think so. I like, I like hearing what the people <laughs> had to say. Cause I promise, I promise. I really did w was super interested in that. Uh, Sean says Vince is a clown. <laughs> there you go, Sean. Uh, Khalil says, I usually agree with everything you say, but come on now it's been over. It's been like over 10 years time to move past it. It was super, I was super upset when it happened too, but. The truth is, VC put Toronto on the map. Who cares how he got 25K? Time to move on, my friend. Uh, Paulo. Tell that to Vince. <laughs> Paulo says, LOL, Moose got out of the way to let Vince dunk the ball. Actually, every Raptor, with the exception of the French G League kid, got out of the way. I guess he talked about Boucher? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, let him get out of the way for that. I'm more pissed about Nurse bringing Kyle back with five minutes left to play and keeping him in after he got whacked in the nose. That pissed me off. I agree with you. Nah, that's uh, the Philly in him, though. You, you think you're going to take Kyle Lowry out after he gets hit in the face? Hell no. And then there's a bunch of... I give props to these Raptors fans because there's a lot of people that were just like, bro, stop doing this. <laughs> so your whole podcast, you're <laughs> bragging on Vince, bro. The media turn on him, blame him for everything when he was putting up numbers and playing well. I don't really know about that part. Um, Danny says, LMAO, let's just talk about the actual game, right? So there are still some diehard Raptors fans there that were just like, you know, get out of here, Vince. But I found that interesting, and I kept my promise. I told the people, hey, send us your takes. Let us know what you think, and we're going to read your comments on the podcast. So there you go, right? Vince Carter, I'm still sticking with lame, 25K. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, our next topic here, though, Webby, on turn up, turn down. This is pretty simple. Blow up the Wizards already. <laughs> now, oh. the reason why it comes up this week, because I think we had that, qu or some some faction of that question a couple weeks ago, right? Right. When uh, And then John Wall was in the, the hot tub, and that was when the Stephen A. Smith. <laughs> yeah, and the about club. The, the club. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so this week, the reason why it comes up is because Woj, Put up a story, and it started with this tweet that said, The Wizards find all-star John Wall for unloading a verbal barrage onto coach Scott Brooks in a recent practice. After Wall and his teammates had been challenged to raise intensity in that season, Wall fired back with F.U. to Brooks. 
story soon. <laughs> this sounds like a lot of fun. There are other stories that came out too about like Bradley Beal in that same practice, essentially trying to like rally up the troops and then pointing at the GM saying like, hey, I've been dealing with this crap for eight years or however long he's been there. Yeah. This year seems like a gong show. The story oh. basically came out saying the wi the Wizards are signaling signaling a willingness. Wow, that's a tongue twister there. Signaling, signaling a, a, willingness. a willingness. Right? Oof. One more time. Let me try that. The Wizards are signaling a willingness to consider trade overtures on the entire roster, including all-star guards, John Wall and Bradley Beal. Mr. Webster, I ask you. Blow up the web the wizards all I was about to say blow up the Websters already. Wow. <laughs> like what? Blow up the wizards already? Turn up or turn down, Mr. Webster. Boy, yeah. This should have been done about two years ago. Right? You know? And now you're at a point where this is just ridiculous. Well, not only that, but you paid John Wall already. So first of all, yes. if you want to blow up the wizards, you're probably gonna have to keep John Wall around because he's owed like Another, what, $120 million over the next four years? Nobody's going to be taking on that contract unless you're giving getting rid of him for almost nothing. Yeah, it is quite pathetic. You know, when you break down those, those uh, salaries and you look at the Wizards' contracts for next year, next year John Wall is slated to make $38.2 million. That's Otto Porter ridiculous. Jr. next year slated to make $27.3 million. Oh. Again, Otto Porter Jr. slated to make $27.3 million next year. Bradley Beal next year, $27.1 million. Seems like and a then steal. Jan Mahimi, $15.5 million. Oh, that's next brutal. So, Does Jan Mahimi yeah. even play? I don't think so. Oh. I don't think so. Um, it's pretty bad. And the wall extension, right, basically averages $42 million for four years. It's just a bad place they're at right now. And you got to look at. Yeah, I mean, I don't know who would make the move for John Wall. I think maybe it's got to be a team like maybe Phoenix, who's just kind of desperate to make a splash of some sort. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know who would actually make that trade to acquire John Wall. But then Bradley Beal is probably the more attractive piece. But what would you really give up for that? You know what I mean? Like, it, it's they got to do something, right? And it's got to be more than the traditional, oh, we'll just get rid of the coach. Because I think it's got to be more than that. We've seen that well, under multiple coaches, also, these guys just don't fit. They also have to get rid of the coach. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> Scott Brooks is not very good. Yeah. But the thing, is, it's like, yeah, you're going to have to gut this team. And it, it, it it's funny, like, you're going to have to give, give up on these guys and take nothing back in return. Yeah. It's and tough. you are going, going to have to start from day one. It's funny, I was listening to, and I hate to plug another podcast, but I was listening to Bill Simmons today. Oh, hold on. That's, that's, as uh, David Jacoby calls him, that's a pod father, man. Come on. That, it's a pod father. we got to give, <laughs> give respect. But he had his buddy House on, and he said, yeah, Otto Porter, how many, how many all-star games is Otto Porter going to play in, <laughs> in his career? You know what that number is? Is zero. <laughs> like... Yo, you're paying this guy twenty something million dollars, Otto Porter Jr. Like you're Hold on. You're Otto to... Porter Jr. is losing minutes right now to like Jeff Green. Yo and uh, Kelly Thomas, Oubre, no? You're forgetting about Thomas Sadoransky as well. <laughs> who's probably the best player on the Wizards. On my block they would say that now make it. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, like this should have like we see so many of these NBA teams. Really, uh, professional sports teams across all sports make the same mistake. Yeah. You you run it back, you run it back, and you run it back because you had a couple of good years when really you have to be as cutthroat as the Patriots are in football. Yeah. You have to be able to pull that plug the, as soon as a little doubt creeps in. Otherwise, you end up with the situation that the Wizards are in where you've got mo hundreds of millions of dollars dedicated to three players who who can't play on the same team and probably aren't that good yeah. other than Beal. I think Beal still has a lot of value, but, man, you're going to get nothing back in return for him, and you're just going to have to eat shit if you're the Wizards and start anew. And this is year one of John Wall's new contract, and you're already hearing about people worrying about his work ethic and is he taking care of his body Bro, and is he, he farting showed up, too much. Showed up my size at camp <laughs> this year. 
right? And this is year one. Like, how much better do we think that's going to get, right? And where's, where's he going to go, really, right? Because you got to send him to some place where you can't party, right? Like, you can't you can't put John Wall. go like, to Miami. Miami right? Exactly. Yeah. You can't have him in Miami. That's not going to work, right? Nah, man. Oh, nah, that's be crazy. Indiana? Nah, but Indiana could... <laughs> Right. Right. You got to send them someplace like that. That's amazing. But yeah, it's definitely time to blow up the Wizards. They got to do something. Uh, We both agree on that one. Let's move on to the next turn up or turn down again for the newbies. We make a hot take. Turn up equals good. Turn down equals bad for said hot take. Next up, Duke could beat the Cavs in a game. Yes. Duke University could beat the Cavs in a basketball game. Mr. Andrew Webster, turn up or turn down. Well, uh, Shelly, of course, you're talking to the number one Duke super fan on the face of the planet. Did I notice that you uh, changed your avatar changed. on Twitter? Did I notice that? And everybody was like, yo, what happened? Did you lose a bet? I was like, no, I'm just the number one Duke super fan of all time. <laughs> Did you not know that? Did you not know that I love Duke through and through? Um, um, I've been trying to catch all their games. Um, so did you catch be, their recent game against Gonzaga? No, that was, a, that was the one that I missed because oh. it started. I think it started early. I, I was it still did. at work. Yeah, it was during and the by game. The, and then by the time I got home, it was already over. Or it was like I turned on the game and there was like, I don't know, two minutes left and they were down by eight points. I was like, ah, shit. Yeah. But in the games that I've watched, which were all wins, I would still say that no. No. I'm one of these people who don't believe that even the best college team – could beat the best pro or the worst pro team in any sport yeah i agree with that too right like it's just a thing where it was a funny thing to talk about and it gained a lot of traction right like it was all on it was on all of the hot take shows because you look at the Cavs roster and especially without kevin love there's no real like superstar there but you know he's not a superstar but he was a guy that did play in college last year and his name was colin sexton he still plays on the Cavs. And I'm well, pretty sure for, that he would give Tyus Jones' little brother the business. Yeah. Right? No, not only that, but it's like as soon as you get like past the starters on Duke. Exactly. And the, and you, the ninth guy for Duke and the ninth guy on the Cavs, <laughs> th- that's where the real separation is, right? Well, like, but even the starters on Duke, like Tristan Thompson is going to work. Like he's grabbing every single rebound available in that's that true. game, right? Like, he, he almost he, – he will also get dunked on by Zion. <laughs> well, this is this is what I can't wait. Like even his misses. Like I was watching the Auburn game, yeah. and Zion was looking to end somebody <laughs> every time he goes, dude. Like I I could honestly write a dissertation about this kid. Just be, you should not be able to be that big yeah. and jump that high and be that quick. Even in the air when he goes to take the ball from where his hands are to the rim, just that movement with him is so incredibly quick. Like, he's going to get somebody, and it's going to end their life. Like, and we're not going to – it's going to be like a Blake Griffin situation where uh, a Blake Griffin, Timothy, uh, Timothy Mozgov. Like, <laughs> Zion's going to get somebody, and it's going to become a verb. So I think you just gave us the answer to the question, but I said a new weekly thing. Going to check in to see who would you take number one, Zion oh, or RJ. I'm guessing your answer is still Zion. So, and I was talking with this uh, uh, with our old colleague Matt Trapel, another oh, former Maddie. Sportsnet em- Sportsnet employee. We were talking about this on our way to work, mm-hmm. and we were talking about this. You know, listen, RJ Barrett has all the tools that you'd want on a basketball player. Yes. All the tools. But if you were a Knicks fan or a Hawks fan and you had the first overall pick and your team took R.J. Barrett over Zion, how angry would you be? <laughs> like, at, at, at some point, basketball is an entertainment industry. A- yeah. And to sell jerseys and to put butts in seats, like, Zion Williamson – is a circus freak. That's a tough one to argue. I know what you're saying. I'm still I'm still on the RJ train. I know what you're saying. I get it and I totally understand that for that for the exact reasons that you you put up there and he is a genetic freak of nature, but I'm still taking RJ and it was interesting to watch that the end of that Gonzaga game cuz it was funny cuz I was leaving work. The game was I think it started at 5 o'clock, and our show ended yesterday and I'm still at work and I needed to leave. Like the Raptor game was starting at seven 30. Yeah. And so at this point it's like six 45, I should have left work already, but I had to watch the end of that game. 
and it was so good. But basically, Duke lost because they just gave the ball to RJ and had Yo, him run ISOs. That's the thing. It's, it's like, college, so dudes are basically like zoned up, and they're just clogging the middle, and they had like no like action. Do you know what I mean? Like all the other guys were just standing around watching RJ, and it's like uh, that's not really yeah successful offense. That is the one basketball. thing, and that is the one thing that I've kind of noticed with our with Zion when he plays is that he does a lot of hanging around. You know, now obviously, listen, again, it's November in college basketball season. I'm yeah. sure that these guys aren't going to be cutting off the ball, off ball screens. Yeah. You know, I'm not blaming him on that. And especially a guy that big, you know, I don't want him to get gassed out here in the first month or two of the season. Mm-hmm. But I would like to see him work a little harder off the ball. That'd be nice. But again, if I'm taking first pick overall, it's, you know, especially if I'm the New York Knicks, like I'm telling you, Porzingis, Zion, Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving. There's your four. We we kind of skipped over and we were going over the NBA highlight or uh, headlines. Sorry, from this week. And one of the things, as you just mentioned, the Warriors. Warriors continue to struggle. Um, they lost to the Oklahoma City Thunder, who so, a team that Kevin Durant might be ooh. familiar with. Um, but that just highlights some problems here with this team as Draymond and Steph continue to be out for your Golden State Warriors. But I'm going to ask you two things. First question is, are you worried at all about the Thunder, or not the Thunder, about the Warriors and their championship hopes at this moment? Uh, no, no. Uh, if Steph and Draymond had been playing, or literally if Steph had been playing and they'd lost four straight or – Five of the last six, whatever it's been. Yeah, they've lost four straight in five of their last six. So then I'd be worried if, if if Steph was playing. But there's been no Steph and there's been no Draymond. Yeah, and so my next question to you is, as you know, I'm always one to bring up the conspiracy theories here, Webby, and you then debunk them and bring me back to real life. <laughs> but follow me here. Do you think in any way, shape, or form that – Okay, this thing happens with Draymond. They suspend him. Draymond's upset about it. But then also Draymond now, because you just took money from him, he's like, you know what? I'm I'm injured. I'm going to chill out for a minute. And it, say, it serves two purposes. One, you let Draymond sulk and do whatever he, he wants so that he's not really that mad. But two, you give KD the reality check of, yeah, this is what it's like when you play on a team when there's just one other all-star with you in Clay Thompson. Go, enjoy that for a while. And then you know what's going to happen? Steph and Draymond are going to come back, and they're going to reel off like 20 straight games. Do you think there's a little bit of see what you got here type thing going on? Let KD see like, oh, this is how difficult it is when everybody's focused on me and me alone, huh? Not only that, but it's also very smart. And I think maybe a very smart coaching decision by your favorite coach in the NBA, Steve Kerr. (laughs) And that not only are you giving this idea to Kevin Durant that he really needs to be part of this bigger unit, but you're also saving a couple of miles on Curry and Draymond Green, your two most important players for the stretch run down in in 2019 in spring and early summer when the playoffs are. Did you just say their two most important players are Steph and Draymond? For the Warriors, yeah. Okay, just making sure because I'm not one. I, I'm I'm not one to you know downplay how important uh, Draymond Green is. I'm not that guy, right? There was a camp that was like really downplaying Draymond's importance to that team. I'm not one of those guys, so I agree with you there in terms of how important Draymond is. So I don't I don't think they win well. I don't think that they win, what has it been, three and four years? Oh, I mean, they're going to, I mean. I don't think they win, I don't think they win three and four years without Draymond. They probably win a couple, you know, but they don't keep winning like this without a guy like that on their team. And you want to talk about the opposite of Boston. I mean, you can say what you want about the personality of Draymond Green or how he talks to people, how he talks to the referees, but that is one guy who you do not need to worry about getting involved in an offense. Yeah. No, for he, sure. He knows his role. 
He knows what makes him successful, and he knows what he does for that team makes that team successful. Definitely. And just the other, like, intangibles, getting them fired up, all that stuff, being the motivator, you know, like, that that stuff matters more than people think. Let me rephrase that. People who didn't play sports don't understand that, but you need that guy in your room to hold people accountable, keep people in check, right? Uh, The wild card. Yep, definitely. Um, This Warriors talk, I didn't plan it out like this, but it kind of leads us into our Feed Me segment. And... We start with this because there was the video surfaced online and Kevin Durant, we know that Kevin Durant got fined uh, $25,000 for this, but the video surfaced online and it has Kevin Durant when they lost to your boy Luka Doncic in Dallas. Doughy or white, we're still... (laughs) The the mystery continues? The poll is still out there. We're still getting numbers (laughs) in. The the ballots are still coming in. (laughs) Kevin Durant is on tape. Someone filmed it. There's cell phones everywhere, right? But he walks up to a fan courtside in Dallas and says, quote, watch the effing game and shut the F up. And for that, Kevin Durant was fined $25,000. By the league and, or the team? Uh, by the league. Ah, okay. By the league, yes. He was fined by the NBA. And it was actually kind of funny, too, because the way that the internet works is so amazing, right? And it's funny. I'm tiptoeing around this conversation, but... It's funny working in television (laughs) while also watching what the internet is doing and how content flows on the internet, right? (laughs) And I say that because our Feed Me segment, I'm adding this in as well, Kevin Durant found out about his fine from Chris Haynes while recording Chris Haynes' podcast. (laughs) So Chris Haynes is sitting down. Look this up because it's actually pretty cool. Chris Haynes is sitting down doing an interview with Kevin Durant, and he pulls out his phone, and he sees that, oh, News just came out. Like, I'm breaking this right now. You just got fined $25,000 <laughs> from the NBA for that, right? So he and KD end up talking about it. And Kevin Durant, I want to ask you about and get your opinion on this. Kevin Durant said, quote, grown men can't come to games and heckle grown men. That's corny. That's weak. Close quote. Your thoughts, Mr. Webster. You know what's corny is going on Instagram and finding negative <laughs> comments about you and then replying to those comments. I, how does he have the gall? How does he have the gall to say that when right? he literally is a grown man who's heckling <laughs> other grown men on social media? Not even just grown men. Kids. Right? You know, well, didn't the one kid one time be like, I'm actually like 19 or yeah. something like that? Wasn't that one thing? <laughs> Yo, that uh, the the, hip- the best rebuttal I saw to this, someone was like, someone on Twitter was like, "Oh, I find it interesting that Kevin Durant had the energy for the fan, but he didn't have that same energy when Draymond checked him, though." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Oh, very true, very true." Now, now to be fair, I mean, those, those professional athletes, especially NBA players, where the crowd is so on top of you like that, they must just mm-hmm. hear some ignorant shit that would drive us to go absolutely nuts. And the fact that they are able to tune all of that out and focus on a game like they do yeah. is incredible. However, the hypocrisy of yes. Kevin Durant there with that yeah. statement is crazy. Cuz I'm on your side with the hypocrisy of it all because you know, if people who listen to our podcast especially recently know that I abide by the laws of Steven Jackson, respect it or check it, yeah. which basically means you could do whatever you want, but I'm gonna check you on if I have an issue with it, I'm a check. Yeah. Right? Respect. Don't be check surprised. So if a fan, like I wouldn't advise fans to to talk that loose to anybody else, no matter what situation it is, right? I wouldn't advise you to heckle anybody unless you're willing to defend it, right? So I see where Kevin, I see the side what and what Kevin Durant's saying, and you know, hey. I wouldn't advise you to talk greasy like that to anybody, but fans for some reason think that they can do that. And Hey, every once in a while to go back to the laws of Steven Jackson, that is a dude that did literally beat up a fan. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> so to take that respect it or check it, all I'm saying is I wouldn't advise people to talk greasy to anybody like that, unless you're willing to defend it. Kevin Durant though, that is pretty hypocritical of you to call out the fan as being corny and weak and grown ass men, you know, heckling other grown ass men when you're in Twitter mentions and having fake burner accounts to like tweet at fans. 
I don't know. It's like every it's day, tough. like whose Instagram was he on talking it's shit? Tough, it's tough. It's tough. But hey, thank you for giving us content for our Feed Me segment. I appreciate you, Kevin Durant, for that. Yeah, always, uh, every late week. breaking on the Feed Me segment. As we said, we're filming this on Thursday, which is Thanksgiving in the United States of America, which means football. And there was a funny uh, Instagram that popped up. Insta story, as oh, you yeah. say. From your man's Markel Fultz. Markel Fultz probably enjoying his Christmas dinner as, I guess we'll get to this. Thanksgiving. Thanks, I said Christmas, right? Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. See, I just got Christmas on my mind because watching Americans. Because we're almost social, there. But watching I Americans know. and their social media and like how they do Thanksgiving, right? It makes me jealous because in Canada, we don't do Thanksgiving like that. Yeah, it's the best part about American Thanksgiving because late November, you get a full turkey meal. With all the fixings, Mm -hmm. gravy, everything. It's amazing. And then a month later, you do it again (laughs) with Christmas. It's two huge turkey meals in one month. It's amazing. So good. Um, But Markel Fultz, I'm assuming he's with his family, but they're watching football. And the Dallas Cowboys, another tradition on NFL Thanksgiving, right? Big game by Amari Cooper, but one of his touchdown celebrations, he grabs a ball, pretends to do a free throw, and does the Markel Fultz motion, the hit the hit motion, where he basically was, I don't know what you even call it, juggling the ball back and forth between his hands before shooting the free throw. Yeah, yeah. To try and get himself in rhythm, <laughs> I guess, is what the thing so was. So this yeah. Instagram video, if you just go to Markel Fultz on uh, Instagram, at Markel Fultz, it's just him watching it with his family, and he's like, watch this, watch this. And he's recording Amari Cooper doing this, basically mocking him. But Fultz is laughing and joking around. And I sent that to you, Webby, and your point was? Hey, uh, uh, especially of this week of all weeks with yeah. Fultz, to have a sense of humor about this and not to get a pouty or, or be a little B yeah. about it, I thought, I thought said a lot about Fultz's personality. And it's just funny. It is and, funny, and, right? A hundred percent, and it was a great celebration by Amari Cooper because, like, we we've all seen that crazy <laughs> pre-shot ritual by Fultz now over the last yeah. week, especially as sports fans. But I mean, it's been a tough week for Fultz with the story that's come out about you know Woj reporting that he wanted out of Philadelphia. He wants to change the scenery. He's got a wrist problem. Yeah. There's some injury things. Obviously, the shot has gone completely off a cliff here in the first month of the season. And, and honestly, no one would have faulted him for not responding about something that happened in a football game on Thanksgiving when you're supposed to be with your family. But the fact that he put this on Instagram and was laughing about it and everything and had a big smile on his face, I thought said a lot about who he is as a kid and as a person. Definitely. I, I agree with you 10,000%, right? Like, you... like. Instead of, you know, giving it time for it to become a joke online, you become like you own it. Right. And then you become you become part of the joke maker instead of just being the joke. Right. So I thought that was really fun. It's kind of I thought that was really cool. It's kind of crazy that we brought up Kevin Durant and it's like the complete opposite of what Durant would have done in this Ah, situation. Right. Interesting. Interesting. Yes. Um, but I do want to get your take on what's going on with Marco Fultz now, right? Because he's left the team. Yeah. I, in New York, trying to get some work done on the wrist. It was funny, you know, like that it's story came out. Shoulder. I can't even keep up. So first it was the shoulder. And then in this Woj report, it was that he was getting his wrist looked at and that he, the, well, I, apparently Fultz had said is that he, he'd like to change the scenery. He doesn't want to be in Philly Ooh. anymore. Wow. And, and you know what, like, I, I don't, again, I'm not going to fault the guy for thinking that or whatever, but don't kill your trade value, exactly. man. Exactly. <laughs> right? Like, like I, I'd be more than happy if we were to be able to flip him for, uh, you know, a package of whatever we can get back. But now, because you say that you want to change the scenery, uh, other teams out there are going to be far less likely to give you a good return for a guy like that. Now, it's a shame because, again, I've always liked Fultz. I like, you know, his demeanor, and I think that what's happened with him and his shot is is one of the strangest things I've ever seen in the NBA. And 
I'd like to see the Sixers stick with him and try and develop him. But honestly, man, in the one game that he wasn't on the court, again, and I was saying this at work the other day, the guy I love is T.J. McConnell. Of course, yeah, yeah. And and with no faults on the team, McConnell gets a little more minutes. Your bench is a little deeper now in that you're not kind of wasting time on a guy who's only getting you, what, f- four points, six rebounds, and three assists. Yeah. You know, those those numbers they were giving to faults in the starting lineup can now be divvied between a couple of different players. That makes Philly almost a little more complete. Um, now, that being said, I, again, I wish that they would stick with Fultz and, and give him a little more development because he is still so young. But if he's got to go and he wants to go, I don't think that the Sixers should stand in his way. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you with everything you just said there. It is a weird situation, and it, it does kind of suck because he is just killing the trade value now. But what a first, what, two, three months on the job for Elton Brand? <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, not only just trading for Jimmy Butler, making a splash there, but now having to deal with the Fultz situation, having him just abruptly leave the team and then now making a trade demand, like, that's crazy. But, hey. Welcome welcome to the job, eh, Elton Brand, right? Yo, listen, if Elton Brand can swing anything for Fultz like he did for Sarich and Covington, yeah. I'm going to be really happy. <laughs> right? All right? Um, super funny there. And you know what? It's pretty It's pretty funny to, if you see the clip of Markel Fultz watching the video. Just go search Markel Fultz on, on uh, Instagram right now as you're listening to this. And as I was talking about it, it reminded me of a conversation I had earlier this week. We were talking about like consumption and people in the room were so like flabbergasted at the note at the the notion that people can be watching tv and looking stuff up on their phone at the same time (laughs) and i was just like what i was so confused by that because i'm like i listen to podcasts all the time i listen to the lebitard show every day where they're talking about hey google this look this up like while you're listening like that's the thing that's how we all consume media in 2018 no like it was so weird exactly. to me that it became this like big conversation but i'm gonna move on before i get myself in trouble and uh <laughs> <laughs> next in our turn up turn down segment oh no sorry speaking of we're gonna move on to our ask on blast segment right and it still kind of does fit into the Feed Me segment because this did flood my timeline on so, Tuesday and night. I, and I only just saw this on your feed on Instagram. I had no idea that any of this even happened. <laughs> so uh, Tuesday night, I guess it would have been. No, Tuesday night. Yeah, Tuesday no, I night. Think Tuesday night. Tuesday or last night? No, it was Tuesday night. Today's Thursday, right? Yeah, okay. it would have been Tuesday night. Yeah. So. Tuesday, it was funny because, well, I'll get to the question first. A question comes from Brandon that says, uh, what are your thoughts on the Pusha T concert in Toronto this week? Now, this comes up because Pusha T did a show in Toronto for those who are unfamiliar, which I feel like if you listen to this podcast, you kind of know the vibe of this podcast, which means we also talk about pop culture and music. And so we talked about the Pusha T and Drake beef. So if you don't really know much about that, I don't know. Get familiar. Uh, get your Googles up. Been I guess. Yeah. Hanging under a rock or something. <laughs> so Pusha T does a show at Danforth Music Hall, which is a super small venue, but a cool venue to do a show. I've actually seen Pusha T there twice. Yeah, I you think. were the first one a couple of years ago. Yeah, right? I've seen him twice. Once was actually a really dope show, and it was actually on Super Bowl Sunday. But it was a Super Bowl where uh, the Broncos got just murdered. Like they got yes. crushed. So I remember the show was about to start and we knew one of the promoters. So they actually texted us. We were down we watched the the we were watching the Super Bowl on the Danforth and then she texted us like, Hey, he's about to go on stage in like ten minutes, so I'd leave now. So at that <laughs> point you look up at the score and it was like Broncos getting shit kicked. It's like, Yep, see a Super Bowl. But anyways, my point is Push a T concert, Danforth Music Hall, great venue. And this was Tuesday night, and obviously it's Pusha T's first show in Toronto since this whole beef with Drake, right? The, the disc records back and forth. And so all these videos start flooding social media. And what happened was, I guess the stage started to get flooded with beers as some concert goers decided to throw their beverages at Pusha T on stage. And then now, how far into this concert was this happening? Like right, uh, maybe four songs in, five songs in. Damn. Yeah, right at the beginning of the show. 
So people start throwing beers on the stage. Again, as you're listening to this, if you just search on Twitter or Instagram, or if you haven't already seen it. But anyways, uh, Pusha T exits the stage, but whoever these dudes are try to get on the stage, but they don't make it past security, and then they get shit kicked by security. So what are your thoughts on this on this Pusha T concert in Toronto, Webby? Oh. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I think I'm leaving out the best part. The best part is after these dudes get beat up, uh, Pusha T comes back on stage, gives like a a profanity laden just rant about like people throwing beers. And he's going on about how he thinks Drake paid people to throw beers. And he's like, mother effer, do you know where I'm from? (laughs) And then just drops don't like. Which might be the hardest, like, watch, <laughs> find that video. That video was, like, the hypest shit ever. Because it's just like, don't you know where I'm from? And he's like, drop that shit. And then, if you know the song, don't like, the way that that song starts with Pusha T on it is just, like, the hardest shit going. So, <laughs> to me, I was kind of like, part of me, I wish I'd, I would have been mad if I went and it got cut short. But at the same yeah. time, being there for that moment would have been so dope because I could just exactly. picture the crowd going crazy as that happened. So what's funny is, is that a, this is not the first time something like this has happened in Toronto. Okay. So a couple of years ago, uh, when I was still living there, um, on the island. Okay. I think it was the island. It might have been the amphitheater, but Oasis was playing. Okay. All right. They're playing Wonderwall or whatever. yeah, yeah. yeah friggin song they're playing and some crazy toronto fan rushes on stage and tackles Uh, one of the brothers yes 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 so is this a toronto thing like getting up on stage and trying to attack an artist i'm trying so hard to stop myself from sounding like the get off my lawn guy which more and more i'm becoming (laughs) i understand 100 percent. but i'm just like guys like I would have been so cheese if I paid money to go to a Pusha T concert and then it got cut short because these kids are trying to get on your six dumb months. Dumbass. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because like really, that's all these kids are trying to do. Drake's not that mad at Pusha T, right? Like Drake no. isn't that mad as you guys are trying to run on stage to fight Pusha T or waste the ten dollar beer you just bought to throw on stage to a concert that you paid money to go to. What? That's my other thing. That doesn't make you any know, sense. I- a Heineken at the Danforth Music Hall has got to cost eight nine dollars. Oh, for sure, it's got to, it's got to. And you're gonna waste that money, throw it up on stage, give it to me, and then get beat up. And then get beat up, <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, come Jesus. on, kids. S- likes on Six Buzz are not worth that much. It's just not. No, it's just not. Come on, no. Kids. Oh man, craziness going on in Toronto. But kids, be safe. Everyone, be safe. It's rap music. Rat beef don't is supposed throw your to stay beers. rat beef. Don't just, throw beers if you go to a concert. Yeah, I mean, and also, too, like, it's a lesson, and I say this all the time, right? In this generation, a lot of the things that happen is because people aren't used to getting punched in the face, right? Good point. Clearly, if you just think that it's cool for you to throw a beer at someone, and then you're going to rush the stage and security's going to calmly take you off, like, come on, guys. What, do you, what are we you doing? Know- what are never we been punched in the face. Never been punched in the face before, man. But anyways, uh, good stuff. Pusha T, I hope he's able to come back to Toronto and just perform a normal show. And I don't know what's happened since. I don't know if Drake said anything about this or whatever. But I assume because of Toronto and the bad press, like I think someone got stabbed. And they think it might have happened at the show or they don't Jeez. really know what happened. So, like, I don't know. I see Drake might have to come out and make some political... You know, like, hey, guys, be safe, blah, 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 like that kind of thing. You know, like this is a guy that wants to do a lot of different things in the city. He can't be associated with stuff like this. Right. Right. So right. anyways, what are we doing, guys? And think about it. It's Pusha T. Do you think Pusha T was coming to Toronto without security? Like, I mean, <laughs> legit security in terms of illegal security and legal security, if you know what I'm saying. Right. Like, come on, people. Be smart. Be smart. And just enjoy the music. Exactly. Um, Enjoy the music as much as I hope you enjoyed this podcast that we do each and every week with my guy, Andrew Webster. Webby, though, if people want to know what's going on in the world of Mr. Andrew Webster, where can they find you? If you want to 
find out who I'm throwing beer at. You can uh, <laughs> no. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and on Instagram, same name at a Webster eighty four. And you can find me on Twitter at Shell Alexander on Instagram at Sheldon Alexander. And of course, you can find this podcast. Shout out to all the people listening and liking and subscribing and rate us on iTunes and SoundCloud and on Google Play. Just search On Blast Podcast. You can get this, which is the Ball On Blast Podcast, which we talk about all the ins and outs from the NBA, as well as some pop culture treats at the end. But also you can find our Wrap It Up podcast, which is yeah. our On Blast Raptors postgame show, done live on Twitter, at Shell Alexander, following each and every Toronto Raptors game. Um, and yeah, you can find all those things as well on YouTube. Shout out to all the people in the YouTube comments as well. Going to try to read those comments on the podcast when we can. So we appreciate the love and the hate at times because hey that's all a part of the game right exactly <laughs> and as we close each and every podcast with the wise words of meek millie which my nephew actually called me today telling me that meek mill had a new song today that i should listen to because it's a banger Ooh. Uh, so i gotta also what also new dipset album dropped today Ooh, okay i got some yeah. listening to do i'm off so tomorrow, so, I'm so we'll report music. back we'll report back on some music next week all right, sounds like a plan, but as the wise words of Meek Millie, I used to pray for times like this to rhyme like this. This is the Ball on Blast podcast, as always, unpolished and unapologetic. Until next time, see ya. Peace. Ball on Blast.